Hello, I'm Brian Stuspinski, and I'm the chair of the OpenMP Language Committee, and I'd like to give you an update on recent activities as a language committee. Um, we're going to start by acknowledging something you may have already heard, um, which is that OpenMP 6.0 will, will be released in November of 2024. We had originally scheduled it for November of 2023, but um, looking at the progress we've made to date, it, it was not going to be everything we wanted it to be, so we decided to delay a year. Um, and the ARB adopted, a, uh, you know, approved that change uh, in October, and so, um, you know, that's now the official word. The reasons for for that are multiple, although probably the biggest reason, in my my opinion, is that. We decided to release OpenMP 5.2 to address a bunch of issues that arose while we were working on 5.1 in terms of quality of the specification. And we had hoped to be able to fit that in, that extra release cycle in without ha impacting the 6.0 release cycle. Um, but realistically, that ended up taking more of our time and energy than, than we had to spare and, and still get 6.0 done the way we would want it done by uh, November of 23. Um, and that's in addition to their, you know, people have had less time and energy to work on uh, OpenMP in the last couple of years due to the pandemic. Um, and frankly, um, a lot of the work on the, on the, specification gets done when we have face-to-face -face meetings, which obviously we weren't having during the pandemic, but still made pretty good progress. Um, but and, and we're back to having face-to-face -face meetings, but fewer people attended than might have, and so we got less work done um, at the two face-to-face -face meetings we've had this year. Um, ultimately, though, the decision is really just looking at it and, and realizing that if we were to follow the the process that we want to, that we have established and wanted to follow, which is that the we would release a, a comment draft um, early next summer and then have the final release in November. Um, we didn't have enough signi enough significant features done at this point, so we decided that it would be better to um, put it off for a year and have the the level of uh, improvements to the specification that we wanted to see, the level of new features. Now, you might think, well, does this mean you're really going to make the 24 day? Uh, I'm confident that we will. Um, first of all, we, we did release TR11, and it has s some good progress in it. But more importantly, we've made a lot of progress um, towards uh, having the kinds of features we want to have added um, even that aren't necessarily reflected in TR11, but have been reflected in our process. Ultimately, TR11 is pretty typical of where we would be a year into the process, which um, given what happened with five, releasing 5.2 last November is really about as far as we are in, in the 6.0 process. Um, now, I, I want to go over some of the major features that we're targeting. Um, we've made comments in the past, but these are, are really much firmer uh, impression of what we're going to do. Um, so the first big thing that we're focusing on in, in the very near future uh, and getting done, and this I am confident will be available in TR12 that will release next November, is what we're calling free agent tasks. And what this does is it allows us to support task, ta task parallelism at the top level of, of your program. So you don't need, you won't need once this is created to have um, an OpenMP parallel region just in order to execute your tasks in parallel. Um, what it really amounts to is that if you put the free agent clause with the value true on a task, on an explicit task construct, then any OpenMP thread can execute that task, essentially. All right. Um, it also has some restrictions for what runtime routines you can use, or at least um, what values they'll return. 
Um, in particular, if you call ONP get num threat uh, get thread num, you won't get um, a, a value that makes any sense if a free agent thread or task is, is executing that particular task. All right. We're also making a lot of progress on improvements for use of, of a single device um, in the OpenMP uh, device uh, model. Some people call it the offload model. It's um, where you can call a target region and execute code on, on an explicit, uh, explicitly on a different device. Um, one of the things we did adopt in TR11 are explicit progress uh, guarantees. So basically what, what we've said is if you have code being executed in two different progress units, then you can be assured that um, that code will make progress even if they're in the same uh, parallel team, no matter where they're being executed, all right? And so this allows us to do things like um, recognize thread blocks on, on GPUs, for example. Um, we're going to add further extensions that will allow you to explicitly determine whether or not you're in the same progress unit, and if you're not, then you know that you can make progress. But if you are, um, we'll also allow you to do things like rely on the fact that um, you're basically making lockstep progress. Um, we've done things to better in support understanding which devices are visible and which device is the default device uh, using environment variables and uh, internal control variables. These things are, are both already somewhat available. In, well, the, this, the device stuff is available in TR11 as well as explicit progress degrees. Um, we're also significantly improving the use of device memory. We've added a, a new directive, the group private directive, which says that you want a private copy in each contention group of a given variable, all right? And that will allow a compiler to very easily say, oh, okay, I'm over-executing on this GPU. Let me use GPU shared memory for that. And so now I can know that I'm getting it allocated where I want. Um, we've also done a bunch, add, added a bunch of improvements for allocators. Um, allowing you to fix the partition size and, and get some other information back about the um, memory that you're gonna be getting out of the device, on the device, and also to be able to allocate um, memory on a given device from the host or potentially from other devices. Initially, it'll primarily be implemented to be able to allocate device memory from your host code. Um, we're looking at additional improvements for single devices, including um, extensions to support deep copy, and also the, this co-execute directive that basically allows you to offload lang uh, array language uh, in Fortran. And we're also looking at ways to include support for that in C and C++. Um, a big thing, now a couple other things that we're actively working on, and I, I'm hoping we'll get done. Um, we'll get some of these done, uh, maybe not all of them. One thing that we've been very actively considering is support for event-based parallelism. So this basically allows you to execute um, an event loop with one parallel team and have that event loop um, generate tasks that are then uh, explicitly going to be executed by a, a different team. And so this will require us to be able to identify you know, somehow have a handle that says, this is the team I want to execute this task. Um, the idea is, you know, for example, if you have a, an event loop where you're observing mouse events, you can generate a task that might do something that's fairly heavyweight in computation, such as doing a, a um, DGEM. And you can go and execute that um, off in a different team and know that you'll still get responsiveness with the thread executing the, the team that's monitoring the event. Um, this will also be useful for um, potential support we're, we're considering in the longer term for uh, real-time programming. Uh, another big area that we're looking at is support for using multiple devices. We've already added um, scoping 
support for atomic and, and other for atomic operations and other memory operations so that you can know that when you execute an atomic operation it's visible not only it, it executes atomically not only on the device that that's executing that operation but um, all devices or potentially on specific other devices um, more importantly we're looking at ways to be able to support bulk launch so you can start uh, target regions in, in one go across multiple devices and also things for updating data across multiple devices so you can basically broadcast from one device to a set of other devices um, we'll also be looking at, at other collective operations that can be implemented uh, across the multiple devices um, it, it eventually potentially not in the six that at a time frame will add support for distributing work across devices so you could take a, a very large loop and have it automatically partitioned across devices eventually uh, what we'd like to do is relax the restrictions on nested target regions because it would be useful for having true support for multiple devices to be able to um, offload code to one device and then have that code offload to yet another device well but wait there's more um, so something that we've already added started adding in tr11 is more loop transforming directives we used to call these loop transformation directives but we looked at the names of our properties and realized that loop transforming was a better name for them uh, we've added support for a reverse directive that says um, take these iterations and instead of executing them in the order that, that the code would normally have them, execute the logical iterations in the reverse order. Um, and then we've added an interchange directive that can take a, a loop nest and permute the um, loops within it. All right. Um, in, in a simple loop nest of two loops it will simply interchange the two loops but you can you can actually specify more complicated um, permutations we're considering other transformations and i expect that we'll add at least some of these so taking um, two loops taking one loop and splitting it into two loops taking two loops and fusing them into one loop taking a loop nest and collapsing it down into a single uh, loop and then you can then apply other transformations to it um, then also the nestified transformation which allows you to take an imperfectly nested loop and um, prescriptively tell the compiler how to turn it into a perfectly nested loop we've added in tr11 something called the apply clause which allows you to specify um, a loop transforming directive and then apply other loop transforming directives to the resulting loops from the first transformation. Um, in the long run, what we'd like to do is take um, things like the work sharing loop and the distribute construct and characterize those as transformations, which will then allow us to um, specify applying them to the results of loop transforming directives or um, to specify um, applying loop transformation other loop transforming directives to the the distributed work from those uh, loop parallel loop directives um, okay so then uh, a big thing that we're working on very actively right now, and so I expect we'll also be definitely in TR12, is generalized induction. And so generalized induction is the idea that you have, um, it, it's basically generalizing the, the concept of, of the linear clause, which says um, this variable has a well-defined linear relationship from one logical iteration to the next. Uh, the original linear variables were actually the loop iteration variables uh, what we're going to do is allow you basically to specify any well-defined function as long as you can specify um, how the value of that um, 
variable is related to its, a, its value prior to entering a loop and the specific logical iteration that you're on. Uh, and then once we've done that, we're actually likely to go back and instead of characterizing linear and the linear clause and loop iteration variable the way we have currently to specify them in terms of inductions. Uh, these will actually be also very similar to uh, reductions in that we'll have a declare induction directive that will allow you to specify not only uh, simple um, induction relationships such as some, some inductions and, and multiplicative inductions, but also more complex functions, as long as you can, again, specify that relationship to the um, specific loop iteration that you're looking at. Um, and then we're looking at some other things, uh, whether it's better modularity and, and support for multiple compilation units or other um, forms of parallelism. I suspect those things will probably not make it into TR11, but we are looking at them. So a big part of what we'll be doing in 6.0 is continuing the work to improve the quality of the specification that we began in 5.2. Um, that allowed us to really improve how this, the specification is written and allowed us to ensure that it was much more consistent uh, in terms of how clauses work and how they're actually specified. Uh, we're looking in the long term at, so in order to do that, we basically build up a database that we use to generate large parts of the specification. And then if we ever use something twice, we go and pull it out of the database. And that way we're guaranteed that it's consistent throughout the specification. So that, that's one of the big ways that it improved the consistency. So we're looking at, at adding other things to that database, including um, the events for tool interfaces and other aspects of the tool interfaces, and also potentially um, the runtime um, functions. Uh, we're also looking at, at doing things to improve, continue improving the readability of the specification. We added a number of properties for directives and clauses in 5.2. Um, and as we were doing the work, as we were finishing it up, we realized that we could really turn those into database entries and then have that much more clearly and consistently, again, specified. Um, how much of this work will get done in 6.0 is not really clear, but we're going to be continuing it in 6.0, 6.1, and on into the future until we really get everything that, that reasonably could go into the um, database, in the database. Eventually, we'll be able to do things like generate uh, the grammar from the database, generate header files, quick reference guides, um, all of the various things that are providing other ways of, of looking at the OpenMP specification that decides the uh, specification document itself. Um, and again, improving the consistency not only of that specification document, but of all the other documentation we have. Um, we are looking at several other things. Uh, these things have all mostly been done, at least are started in, in, in TR11. We did already remove all the features that we deprecated in 5.0, 5.1, or 5.2, so those are gone. Um, whether the, the ways that they were previously supported um, will be supported by your com specific compiler you take up with your compiler implementer, but the specification has added um, improved ways uh, of saying essentially the same thing that's more consistent with the way we, the language has evolved. And that's all we're going to support in terms of the actual language specification going forward. Uh, we're looking at, at being able to better control whether uh, something is descriptive or prescriptive. Um, if you're familiar with how num thread, the num threads clause has worked historically for parallel constructs, uh, in the end, the number of threads you ultimately got was essentially implementation defined. 
We've now added a, a, a strict uh, modifier for that num threads clause that says, give me this many threads or else I want you to, to have an error and stop the program or at least print out some kind of warning. Uh, we're, we're likely to extend uh, some of this better prescriptive control to uh, SIMD, the support for SIMD in, in OpenMP. Um, and so that way you can actually say, look, I want you to actually SIMDize the, the, this loop. Don't, don't just take this as a hint, which um, the SIMD constructs currently are. Um, and generally, in, we're, we're looking, perhaps not in the 6.0 timeframe, uh, of providing a mechanism that, that generally allows you to say, I want this to be prescriptive or I want this to be descriptive. I want it to be strict or a hint. And then um, the compiler will either give you an error or you know, some well-defined error behavior. If it can't meet this, the strict request or um, it will hopefully take into account that you said, I think this is a good idea, but if you think something else is better, go ahead and do it. Um, we're also continuing to improve support for uh, C++. Um, we're looking at being able to support um, on a specific variable, for instance, that you want it to be thread private, that you want uh, specifying an attribute, that you want to declare a, a function to be a declared target function or a variable to be a declared target variable. Um, we've done a number of other changes. Uh, that, that are continuing to improve. Again, just the, the way we think about OpenMP, um, back in OpenMP 3.0, um, CAS support was for, first added to OpenMP, and largely the, the execution model was, was changed to being task-oriented. It was not fully changed, and over the years um, since 3.0, some uh, inconsistencies and flipping back to a more thread-oriented execution model had occurred. We're working at getting back and, and moving towards being a fully task-oriented execution model that still has um, explicit threads that, that you can control how they interact with the tasks. Anyway, so um, all those things and more, uh, we've already adopted 67 issues in TR11. There's a whole bunch of them that uh, over 200 that are uh, being considered for 6.0. I expect we'll have over 200 uh, approved issues by the time we get to November of 24. Um, but many of those issues in the over 200 that we have may well get deferred beyond 6.0. And, um, you know, with that, that's the state of the the OpenMP language at this time and where we're going into the future. And uh, as always, uh, I hope you uh, will contact us if you think that something could be improved further. <laughs>